welcome folks who are starting to arrive who may come in soon uh, welcome to everyone um and uh just confirm oh, good looks like we're online and going so uh, a welcome i'm melody brown birkins i'm the director of the institute of Arctic Studies in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth, which is located on the traditional unceded Abnaki homelands. Um, it is my absolute pleasure and honor to bring to you this very first event for the North American Arctic Speaker Series, a joint project of Dartmouth and the US State Department, co-hosted by the Institute of Arctic Studies in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding and the Office of the US Coordinator for the Arctic Region. Um, the purpose of this speaker series is to amplify and explore the shared knowledge, networks, connections, and ideas of the North American Arctic, a region spanning Alaska, the Yukon, the Northwest Territories, Nunavut, and Greenland. And we are excited to have an incredible panelist, group of panelists joining us for this first launch, specifically to talk about knowledge sharing for climate cooperation and solutions in the North American Arctic. Our experts include Dr. Nikush Carlo, a presidentially appointed commissioner on the US Arctic Research Commission and founder and chief strategist of CNC North Consulting. Dr. Greg Pelzer, co-lead scholar for the Fulbright Arctic Initiative and professor at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Anne-Sophie Hrupskirvidal, uh, Head of Secretariat of the Arctic Hub of Greenland, and Ms. Kate Guy, another Biden administration appointee who serves as Senior Advisor and Managing Director for Climate Security and Cross-Cutting Issues in the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate Change, and who will join us and our panel in just a few minutes. So I wanna make sure we have as much time as possible for the panelists to answer questions today and engage with the audience. So I'll keep remarks very short, but before going to our very first question, I wanted to say a thank you to my colleagues and partners at the US State Department, Office of the US Coordinator for the Arctic Region, Senior Advisors, Ms. Laura Strickler and Mr. Marcus Tomey. I'd also like to thank Ms. Hillary LaBelle, the former senior advisor in that same office for initially conceiving of this idea and of this Dartmouth State Department partnership way back in early 22. My thanks to everyone there. And to begin with our program, I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Carlo, and then move around the panel. But my first question for everyone is that each of you brings years and years of experience to the practice and the art of Arctic cooperation and collaboration to find solutions to shared challenges. And most of you live and work in this region of the Arctic, increasingly recognized for its distinct landscapes and strong connections of its peoples across the region. May I ask you, if you don't mind, to just briefly introduce yourself as you start and then share what stands out to you as a shared challenge or opportunity for tackling these issues of climate change in the North American Arctic region that might be addressed with greater support for collaborations, networks, and coordinated investments in the region. Uh, Dr. Carlo, you first. Hello, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikush Carlo. I am Koyakon Athabaskan, CEO of CNC North Consulting and an academic member on the U.S. Arctic Research Commission. I was um, born and raised in the interior region of Alaska in the city of Fairbanks and the village of Tamna, which is on the confluence of the Tamna and the Yukon rivers. Um, as a founder and chief strategist at CNC North Consulting, I help clients uh, develop a vision for their climate and Arctic priorities, build momentum to achieve change, uh, and foster partnerships to drive forward movement. My true passion is working with organizations that support climate equity and the well-being of Arctic residents and indigenous peoples. Um, a little bit about, uh, I serve as one of the one of seven commissioners to the US Arctic Research Commission. The commission advises the president and Congress on domestic and international Arctic policies. Um, I'll weave a little bit of information about the commission um, throughout my remarks, but the vast majority of them are from uh, represent my own views as an individual uh, commissioner. I wanted to start here <clears throat> at the beginning to um, mention why the Arctic is important to me. It's not only because I have deep roots um, in the region, but also, and really importantly, because of the people who live and work across the Arctic. I can really see that um, all the people that I have met and I have worked with, they really care about um, 
the region about wanting to work together. Um, and I really believe that we can do great things. We can solve really vexing challenges like climate change by working together. And this is essential for us to live um, in balance with the environment far into the future. We all know that the Arctic is warming significantly faster than the rest of the planet. And this warming is, is accelerating at an alarming rate. And we know that the, the, the impacts of climate change are keenly felt across Alaska um, and also throughout, throughout the Arctic. In Alaska, some of you have, may have um, heard about the Typhoon Murbach, which hit Western Alaska. Um, there was severe damage to critical infrastructure at a time when winter was fast approaching, um, making the need for response um, very urgent and the capacity to respond very limited. So that's just one example. I'm sure there are, there are many um, examples of, of these types of severe um, events, um, but also other environmental changes um, that happen within the region, but yet have cascading impacts um, that are growing outside the region. So really what this means um, to me is that wherever you are in the world, you are connected um, to the Arctic region. One of the things that stands out to me as a shared challenge is the need for equity uh, in research. I really believe that Indigenous-led solutions to climate change will build a foundation for society to gain a better understanding of the natural environment, and that we need to support each other um, from a foundation of trust and respect and to commit to do the work to understand what the inequities are um, and the importance of re research um, to unlock the potential for indigenous knowledge and wisdom to heal the planet and find practical solutions. So I'll stop there um, for now. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlo. Um, I will move to the same question about what stands out to you with different opportunities, uh, Dr. Pelzer. You need to unmute, sorry. Yeah, thanks. This is the first Zoom meeting I've ever been on in my life. So it's, it's no, yeah, howdy everyone. And, and thank you, Melody, for, for the kind invitation to, to participate in this. A panel in this particular initiative. So by way of background, uh, at the University of Saskatchewan School of Environment and uh, Sustainability, and I guess I've been working in the Arctic and working with Northern Indigenous communities now for a little over 30 years. Um, most of my work has been in Russia, Eastern Siberia, and uh, more recently in, in Alaska and, and, and in Scandinavia, uh, particularly Norway and, and uh, Sweden. The other uh, thing I've been uh, uh, doing outside of my academic life is actually I've been a negotiator, been a professional negotiator for about 20 years. The last 10 years has actually been with Sask Power, which is our government owned utility in Saskatchewan and working with a First Nation in Northern Saskatchewan uh, around a global settlement that involves these kind of uh, fundamental issues around climate change and, and energy. And so that's, I, I kind of wear two hats when I'm looking at the kind of questions you're posing for us today uh, at Melody. And when I look at the, the challenge around a climate change in the Arctic and in subarctic regions, I, one thing that always strikes me is uh, when your uh, former uh, Secretary of State John Kerry had said at the Glacier Conference back in 2015 in Anchorage that uh, uh, energy policy is the solution to climate change and, and the very heavy emphasis on on uh, the question of energy policy and and that's a vitally vitally important question for uh, northern communities across the circumpolar north and, and obviously when we look at carbon footprint the north doesn't contribute that much but it still contributes of course but when we're looking at this global energy uh transition and uh, this is a, a a point that dr carlo pointed out is if inequities and and here's a great opportunity and we talk about in Canada a lot about the theme of reconciliation with indigenous peoples in Canada and the opportunity for environmental and economic reconciliation I think this is where we have a, 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 almost a once in a lifetime uh, once in a generation opportunity around climate change to, to address some of those inequities 
uh, through uh, through energy. And when you're looking at the transition, you're looking at especially renewable energies. There's some discussions around uh, small modular reactors as well, and and uh, uh, micro modular reactors. But uh, it, but on the forefront, of course, has been renewable energy and things like microgrids. There's an opportunity to address climate issues and and have that circumpolar leadership, but also address uh, energy security levels at the community level for the community, designed by the community. And I think this is really, really important opportunity. The other opportunity I want to identify is really around uh, seizing uh, the opportunity of, of economies of scope. And this is where networks matter. And we often talk about economies of scale growing bigger to to realize cost savings, but economies of scope is a little bit different, where you can partner within a region around a particular economic activity. In this case, it could be renewable energy and energy security, where we actually have leadership right now in places like Alaska, which is the world leader in microgrids and, and penetration of uh, renewable energy. But you think about two thirds of a billion people on this planet do not have electricity services. And, and the solutions in the Arctic can also be solutions shared, whether it's remote places like Nepal or in, uh, in the Andes and so forth. And this is where in, in terms of a global common humanity, uh, these partnerships not only can help communities across the Arctic, but also more globally in other remote regions. And, and I think that's an opportunity we could absolutely seize on. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Pelzer. Um, and I'd like to move to uh, Dr. Skirvidal from Greenland, if you have a moment on the same ideas, shared challenges and opportunities. Yeah, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Sophie Skirvidal. I'm a PhD and head of secretariat at Arctic Hub. Uh, relatively newly is Secretariat functioning as this gathering node for Arctic research stakeholders in Nuuk in, in Greenland. Educationally and professionally, I specialize in public engagement processes and practice. Um, and at Arctic Hub, we work every day to build bridges between science and society. And one of our greatest tasks uh, is to make knowledge from research here in Greenland more accessible for all of us living here in Greenland. And we experience and we're in contact with uh, so many researchers who come here to Greenland to do research and conduct various field works. And a great part of those researchers, of course, focus on climate change. Um, but all of this valuable knowledge generated from this research only um, a small part, small part of this is actually accessible to those of us who live here. So we see kind of tip of the iceberg, so to speak, knowledge wise. Um, and there's so much knowledge uh, hidden beneath the surface, not available or easily uh, as accessible yet. So I think this is a paradox as uh, Greenland with the inland eyes, we, it's become this symbol of, of climate change, but the common citizen arguably holds very little knowledge of how to, um, or what to expect uh, climate wise about the future and how this might affect their livelihoods and how to adapt to the expected changes. So I think one of the more, more important challenges to get hands-on first is to get better and easier access to this knowledge. Um, this holds great potential to build resilience, to improve informed decision-making and promote sustainable development. Um, and this might be a shared challenge across the rest of the North American Arctic. I know it's a, a challenge in Greenland. Um, so, Building more collaborative efforts in uh, order to make knowledge from climate research more accessible to people outside the research sphere is essential, I think. Uh, thank you, thank you. And and yes, I think we, we would all absolutely agree. Um, we will have another person joining, but uh, I will move on to question number two. And just what I heard from everyone was, um, was this idea that we have these shared challenges around climate, and it's not necessarily, I will just say quickly, it's not necessarily around, we want more science, we want more knowledge, but there's what I'm hearing from each of you is how we approach that with in partnership 
in the North American Arctic with the communities um, on the ground, indigenous communities, Arctic communities, is and, and sharing that knowledge is critical. I heard that from all three of you and we'll go in more depth. Um, in the second question I wanted to ask all of you is um, sort of as a follow-up to that first one, uh, do you each have sort of an example of a North American Arctic cooperation, a cooperation in a region that you have spent time in, um, where people are trying to address climate change in a specific way, find a solution, find a path forward that you that inspires you and you think could be a learning opportunity or something to be shared with other colleagues across the northern uh, in Alaska, across the, the Yukon, Northwest Territories, Nunavut and Greenland, where there might be some common thinking and maybe even beyond the North American Arctic globally. What is it that might have inspired you around climate change action and solutions? And um, would you mind sharing? So I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Pelzer this time. And the unmute. No, crying out loud, I'll never learn. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, there's, uh, no, the, the, the arena program that uh, Arctic Remote Energy Network Academy, and that's also closely aligned with uh, uh, folks that were involved with that in the Fulbright Arctic Initiative in terms of these kind of collaborations. And a, a shout out to Ross Virginia from your shop there. Melody was one of the co-leads with Mike Sprague, of course, on the on the original it launched the first two uh, cohorts of the Fulbright Arctic Initiative. But one of the Fulbrighters on that one was uh, Gwen Holdman uh, from University of Alaska Fairbanks. And at that time, she was the director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power. You know, one of the uh, one of the more visionary things um, and, and inspiring things was when she was quarterbacking, putting together with other partners, and she'd be the first to list all the partners from Iceland to Greenland. And so when we're thinking of North America, uh, Arctic, uh, Greenland played a, a very, very important role and still continues to do so along with Canada and the United States in this Arctic Remote Energy Network Academy, which brings together energy champions from across uh, the Arctic and especially the North American Arctic. Um, to have training and learning on sites and sharing best practices in, in getting hands on uh, across um, across the Arctic region in, in a very practical way and how you can move at the community level and address energy uh, questions. And that model um, is something that can absolutely be uh, exported globally. And, and Gwen would be the first to say she also learned that from the United Nations, a similar kind of uh, network academy that was used in the global south. So these ideas, and this is something we've got to be careful about in, you know, when we're working in the Arctic, Arctic exceptionalism. There are other remote places as well um, that have similar challenges that we can learn from and we can teach and this can go back and forth. But one of the really cool stories that came out of, of this engagement is, and I'm going to center it around an individual named Jordan Peterson, who is then the deputy grand chief of uh, Gwich'in uh, Tribal Council, and he's, his home community is a Klavik. He was in uh, Nuvik at the time, and he's wanted to promote energy for Gwich'in communities in the McKenzie uh, Delta. And so he was a participant on the ARENA program. I was uh, very fortunate to be his, his mentor uh, in that uh, particular program. But this is the power of networks and why this ARENA program was so, so, so inspiring. He went through that program very successfully, championing energy uh, back home in uh, the Mackenzie uh, Delta in the Northwest Territories. But then we also, he became one of the key architects of the Community Appropriate Sustainable Energy Security Program, this uh, research and community engagement program. And one of the things he wanted to do is make sure, uh, along with one of my colleagues, Benita Beatty from, uh, she's uh, 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 a Cree uh, scholar from Northern Saskatchewan is this idea of sister communities. We talk about sister cities all the time, whether it's uh, Toronto or, or uh, Pittsburgh getting together, but we don't often stitch together communities. And, and one of the things uh, he wanted to bring together is places like Arctic uh, Village or Fort Yukon, Gwich'in communities and sister communities there, along with sister communities in places like Northern uh, Sweden, whether it's uh, Yalavaria, Jokmok, which are Sami uh, communities, and 
and uh, also in uh, in northern Norway and stitching these so the power of stitching these networks of communities together what's fascinating after it came in that quarterbacking this we're putting this together this arena program also spawned collaborations between Peter Ballantyne Cree Nation and uh, ASAP in helping move forward to design energy systems that would be community responsive and owned in northern Saskatchewan again the power of these networks that are fundamentally driven by northern and indigenous uh, community champions and now this has almost come full circle here. So we've got, so Jordan, who was on the program as a learning about being an energy champion, now has his own negotiating company. His wife is from Old Crow, which in community in Yukon, so he's living in Yukon. And now he's come back and he's being a negotiator uh, for one of the communities in Northern Saskatchewan on their energy system. And so this circle just keeps building it's literally like that pebble you throw out into the water and the ripples go out. And it's really difficult to overstate how important these catalyzing networks can be to build these networks for life that are stitching together these communities of interest across, across the Arctic and that's driving forward the change that we're seeing on the ground. And for me, that uh, ARENA program as, as, as a model of inspiration really stands out. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Dr. Pelzer. And I will next go to uh, um, Dr. that I'm learning how to say it. My, my personally, uh, Scared, 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 Almost, Scared, Scared, thank you. And to you, what's, what is there an example that stands out to you of some cooperation and knowledge sharing? Yeah, I think uh, the example that I want to highlight is kind of resembling the one you mentioned, Greg, but uh, it's not called ASAP, it's called JSAP. Um, and I think in general projects that couple research and education have a very important role to play when it comes to addressing climate change issues, for example. Um, so I think a good example that, that I would like to highlight as an inspirational case um, would be the joint education science and uh, project um, taking place here in Greenland. Um, this program brings together students and educators and scientists from the United States, Greenland and Denmark, to explore scientific research in the Arctic region. Um, they go to Gangasluswak, uh, Sønderstrømfjord, here in Greenland uh, every summer. And I think it's an is inspirational case as it um, not directly, but indirectly, at least, uh, contributes to increased climate change awareness. Um, as the students um, or the program provides students and educators uh, with firsthand exposure to the impacts of climate change in the Arctic, they come here and witness the effect of the melting ice, the changing ecosystems, and um, they gain a deeper understanding of the urgency and importance of addressing climate change. And it also, um, the JSEP engages uh, students in scientific research related to the Arctic environment and climate change, fostering this collaboration between students and educators and researchers from different countries and backgrounds. Um, and I think this holistic approach is, is really uh, essential too. And um, that, you know, the opportunity that the participants gain uh, of learning from each other's uh, perspectives and share best practices and uh, develop innovative approaches to address uh, the cha climate change challenges. Also, I think the, the participants of this program come to serve as good um, climate change champions in a sense. So they become advocates and ambassadors uh, afterwards uh, for climate action because they have this knowledge and the skills also to communicate further uh, the climate science effectively within their own home communities. So I think it's an inspirational case to bring forth in terms of climate change. 
Well, you may know that I will actively uh, support that, given that uh, there's Dartmouth, my Dartmouth colleagues, uh, Drs. Ross Virginia and Lauren Culler, who, who one Dr. Ross Virginia was mentioned out for, um, are part of that program and absolutely enjoy co-creating co that program with their colleagues in Greenland um, and Denmark. And it really truly is a bottom-up real understanding of how to do this, both climate both climate cooperation and, and inter intercultural understanding and engagement. So thank you for that. Um, Dr. Carlo, to you next, what might inspire you? Yeah, I think I'm going to start um, by sharing uh, just really briefly about the uh, commission's goals report. We had a new rules report that came out um, several uh, months ago. This is a biennial report to the White House and Congress and um, <clears throat> it focuses on Arctic research goals and objectives. So <clears throat> um, it highlights priorities, it highlights longstanding challenges, some of the opportunities, some of the emerging issues, it includes international cooperation, which I think relates to um, several of the programs that were, um, well, both the programs that were highlighted by the other panelists, um, and the, the 2023 uh, report includes five overarching and interconnected goals. Um, you can access the full report at arctic.gov. So I'll just mention that um, one of the goals is um, community health and well being. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of things there because um, I think it relates to some of the things that have been mentioned. Um, already. So this goal um, includes recommendations that focus on climate-related health, social risks, maternal health, <clears throat> health disparities between Arctic and non-Arctic residents. It also includes um, research regarding restoration and use stability for Arctic Indigenous languages, um, and also a recommendation to improve Indigenous particip participation and leadership in Arctic research. And I've said this before, but I'll repeat it again, that Arctic, our indigenous um, led solutions to climate change will help us build a foundation to get a better understanding of the national of the natural environment. Um, and really, so I'm going to use this to lead into how I, might we get there and present uh, an approach that I've been using, a framing that I've been using um, to build movements of people who are willing to flip the script and see things from a different point of view. And this is an approach, I think, that is incredibly helpful. I call this the Arctic 180. So looking for where we can flip the script to drive major change for the better. So I'll give you an example. Um, Stockholm, Berlin, Hong Kong, Tokyo, um, have all to stop designing streets for cars and have focused on pedestrian and cyclist safety. And they're now the top rated cities in the world for, for traffic safety. So I'm thinking about how we apply similar 180s to the Arctic and to climate. Um, Here's another example. What if instead of federal agencies holding all research funds, tribes or indigenous organizations held abundant funds so they could issue their own requests for proposals? And these requests could highlight Arctic community priorities. Researchers could um, submit propo proposals that align with those priorities. And this uh, 180, uh, flip approach has been successful in Canada. I'm going to highlight a specific program, the uh, Inuit Kawisagnut uh, Pilarijut program enables um, research in Inuit Nunat um, for Inuit and by Inuit. And so they, this program runs with support from ArcticNet, um, and it's the only Inuit-led governed uh, and directed research program, I think, in the world. Uh, in 2022, they had 1.8 million to support Inuit-led research specifically. Um, some of the work that they supported covers brain and terrestrial systems, health policy, um, knowledge transfer, and again, funded research led by Inuit and response to priorities within the community. So I, I find this um, framing helpful. Um, my goal is to, is to bring together indigenous knowledge and scientific um, knowledge to solve the many challenges that, that we um, face 
together. So I like to bring this um, forward as an example, potentially useful approach. I, I, I want to encourage people to um, think about where you can flip the script, where can you make an Arctic 180, where can you change the power dynamic and structures from the opposite point of view. Thank you, Dr. Carlo. I've, I, I've written down all of it and I'm going to be talking to you more. Thank you so much for, to all of you. Um, and that leads us to our third and last question before I ask, uh, see if there are any questions. Um, but it's an, it's an, it's a, I'm going to give it with, uh, it really follows on everything you all have just said. Um, the communities and indigenous peoples of the North American Arctic have thousands of years of experience uh, already living sustainably with and on the land. Um, as climate and ch change impacts this entire region, these communities are at the front lines of uh, and actively developing their resilience and innovative approaches to dealing with, with the climate change impacts so that their communities and families can continue to thrive. Um, yet the communities are doing this as with incredibly limited resources. As Dr. Carlo just mentioned, we have to see the perspective here of what's actually happening. If there are limited resources encountering challenges with national and gov global governance and funding systems, how do we think differently? So I'm excited to hear more from Dr. Carlo on that. And then as global interests turn to this North American region, Specifically, we know that there's a, a looking at critical minerals and resources for this low carbon economy we all hope for with new infrastructure in the North American Arctic and new investments in global commerce. Um, how do we, again, I think we have a, a good plan with Dr. Carlo, but others please speak to it as well. How do we center and ensure that the North American Arctic peoples, their knowledge, their rights, and their voice are clear in the decisions about the future of the Arctic and our planet? And I will start with you, Dr. Um, Dr. Skier, Skier, I'm getting close, Skierdale, <laughs> please, first from Thank Greenland. You. Well, I, I can follow you completely, Carlo, because I think the inclusion of, of noble knowledge is key to ensuring sustainable development within the Arctic region. And when we talk of matters like natural resources and green transition, I think it's really important to place focus on the empowerment and active engagement of people living in the local communities in the Arctic. And a prerequisite, I would argue, for empowerment and being able to engage actively in decision-making processes is first and foremost this solid knowledge foundation. And then we might be back to um, where knowledge from research can play an important role. Um, but, but I think um, guidelines like the Inuit Circle Polar uh, Council's uh, guideline available online is, is a really great example on how to do meaningful engagement. Um, um, and also in terms of empowerment, I think an initiative like the Ikavik project anchored in Nunavut is a very interesting example on how to bridge local knowledge and actively engage youth. Um, this, their focus is, is placed on how to uh, empower youth to take ownership of the development within their own communities. And um, it emphasizes the involvement of community members on all stages of projects, from the planning and implementation to the evaluation. Um, so through all stages of the project, and I think timely engagement is really important. Um, and they have, for instance, uh, worked together with local youth to uh, develop this list of 45 concrete recommendations on how to meaningfully engage youth in practice. And I think this could serve as an inspiration of, of how to foster uh, meaningful engagement, uh, community resilience, and, and at the end, through that, um, ensure sustainable development that respects cultures and, and local ecosystems. Thank you very, very much. Um, and uh, I should, I think just I'll mention now that I'm going to, my, my team and I are definitely going to make sure that our website with this uh, recording after the fact includes, I'm going to go back to all of you and make sure all of these examples you've mentioned will be listed. So I really appreciate that. Um, next, to, uh, I believe, Dr. Carlo, if you wouldn't mind thinking about, yeah, so, so how do we make sure these voices are, uh, voices of North American Arctic peoples are centered and heard and have a place in decision making? Yeah, I think um, we, um, what's 
bring forward the value of indigenous knowledge. We're really at a moment in, in time where we're in general, I think agreement about the many critical challenges facing the Arctic and, and indigenous communities, Arctic communities are asking for a partnership to address those challenges. And, and one of the things that, that we can do is really bring forward um, indigenous knowledge um, into um, in a more systemic way into um, into decision making, and so that can look different um, for different situations. But I'll, I'll just speak generally. Um, we can think about creating more seats um, at um, national decision making tables. That might mean changing federal processes, um, but including subject matter experts, regional tribal representation on task forces and councils. Um, well, there's the funding aspect of it, which I've talked to, talked about already, but really supporting um, leadership and action specifically from communities of color, low-income communities, um, the I ICC Inuit Circumpolar um, Councils, um, ethical and equitable engagement protocols have already been mentioned. I can't recommend them enough. Um, uh, and really that tagline, I think that is used in there, nothing about us without us, is something we really need to um, take forward. Um, I can point to an example, I think, within the, the, the federal, um, U.S. federal government um, that is worth um, paying attention uh, to because it introduces a different kind of process. Um, the Northern Bering Sea Climate Resilience um, Area um, elevates tribes authority and federal managed dis management um, decisions and recognizes the importance of indigenous knowledge for decision making. So that executive order creates a tribal advisory council. It's a slightly different um, process um, that can be used, I think, um, as a model to address um, many issues, including things like shipping, pollution, marine debris, um, industrial fishing, and can inform other areas like climate action and coordinated Arctic research um, research efforts. Uh, I think we can um, think more about how to support co-production of knowledge, so bringing together different perspectives, um, um, indigenous perspectives, um, science perspectives, um, and really these things together are going to improve observing and monitoring, understanding of the environment. And to um, the previous point that was made, um, thinking about how um, co-production is a process that, that, that follows through um, the entire um, research process from the questions to how you are um, and, the, and the team that you're working with is collecting that data to what kinds of conclusions um, are a result um, of that data and what kinds of products are produced. So looking at that entire um, spectrum, and there are certainly things you can point to that are helpful within the um, um, federal sphere, a number of um, uh, um, there's guidelines on indigenous knowledge. There is um, memos, uh, memorandums, um, executive orders on equity, diversity, inclusion, environmental justice. Like there are sort of these um, helpful, I think, um, uh, emphasis uh, broadly uh, across the uh, federal government that can help set the stage for these changes. I think it's also equally important that these types of changes are also driven um, from the from the more local level and more place-based level as well. And then lastly, the thing last thing I'll mention is that um, I think what we've heard um, throughout the other remarks and and also what I want to emphasize is that we're really committed to and building and maintaining relationships and in order to address uh, systems change or to achieve systems change address inequities um, build um, and create seats at decision making tables bring value um, highlight the value of indigenous knowledge will really depend on the commitment that that we're making to each other um, to build um, and maintain relationships and to work together. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's very concrete and very helpful. And um, so, uh, Dr. Pelzer, you get to also tell us a, a little bit about your thoughts of, of centering voices and decision making. 
Yeah, you betcha. It, and especially if, when we're thinking about critical minerals, there's, there's, uh, if we're going to do an energy transition globally from climate change, there's going to be more mining. Uh, that that's globally that 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 is a reality. And but one of the things that's more hopeful, I think, is when we look in in North America in particular around the mining sector and compare how things have been done globally. Uh, there's a lot to actually be hopeful for that we can actually achieve this in a meaningful way. And if you think about it back in the 1970s and 80s, you know, where mining companies did start more engaging and often mining companies were ahead of government, in fact, um, but deal, dealing with it almost like a legal requirement, they had to. Uh, then over time, that starts to become a practice where there's another phase, I'd say, 80s and 90s, um, where it's going to where it's the right thing to do, uh, this kind of engagement. And now we're at a stage often where companies are seeing this as it's actually good for business. And one example in northern Saskatchewan, where there's uh, uh, very rich uranium uh, mining deposits, where there's very high engagement of Indigenous communities in uh, the mining sector there. When the oil sands were booming about a decade ago and other sectors were losing employees, they didn't. Uh, they were able to retain their workforce because of that very respectful and, and engaged and true relationship that had been built uh, with Cameco, the company, and uh, First Nations communities in northern Saskatchewan. But we're moving now quickly into another area, uh, which is going beyond just a good, a good for business to outright uh, equity, equity ownership, where Indigenous communities, whether here in the Northwest Territories, where I am right now in Yellowknife, those discussions about the interest in being equity owners in mining projects, especially critical minerals, but others uh, that uh, where there's ownership, no longer just being participants in or having jobs or procurement opportunities, which are also very good, of course, but actually owners and make and the decision makers on own indigenous lands. And that model has proven to be it has been successful. We do have examples, of course, in the state of Alaska. But uh, but other sectors where we've seen that happen, like forestry, again, picking on my own province, Aboriginal workforce in forestry across Canada is 5%. In Saskatchewan, it's 30%, six times higher. Why? Because First Nations own the timber li uh, licenses and their own companies are harvesting and they're making decisions where the go and no go zones are. This can work. We've had over 30 years of co-management experience in Canada and other areas. It can work. In the mining sector, for example, come back to the chemical on water testing. That's done by the communities, not the company. And it's part of building this trust, respectful relationship and where indigenous knowledge and indigenous uh, communities are owning these processes and they work and they can be successful. So two of the ways to get there, I, I would just throw it by way of example. One is around, we need to start moving. We talk about it, but don't really do it is around strategic environmental assessment and where we're taking large catchment areas. Because when we talk about engagement and participation by communities that are small, that have limited capacity, there's almost death by committee. And if we're moving forward, we've got to have processes that are robust, indigenous knowledge and indigenous decision-making is at core at this high level, regional level. So we aren't doing death by committee, project by project. And, uh, We've seen these models operate elsewhere. They are successful, they can work. Same with social impact assessments, uh, the same thing. But we also need to have mechanisms. And in Canada right now, uh, our minister, John Wilkinson, is uh, very bullish about this, setting up a fund where there's low interest, accessible equity. So because the capital requirements to be engaged in the critical mineral sector is very high, it's certainly much higher than even the energy sector. Uh, but that, but providing that kind of capital, we've done that before for other projects over 100 years experience in the United States, Canada, Denmark, Greenland. Uh, we can do that here too. It's coming soon to countries near, near you in the North American Arctic. And I think that that is a game changer. It, it's um, yes, seats at the table, but actually ownership, uh, outright ownership and driving the process. So those are my uh, uh, two bits on 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 the critical mineral uh, question. Thank you, Dr. Pelzer, and um, I, uh, uh, Ms. Guy, Kate, thank 
thank you so much for joining us. I know you're quite busy. Um, I've mentioned before, but uh, Kate Guy is an uh, Biden administration appointee serving as senior advisor and managing director of climate security and cross-cutting issues in the office of the special presidential envoy for climate change. And we've gone through some questions, but I wanted to give you a moment to just say hello. And also, if any of the questions I, I think you know we were going to talk about was really, are there ideas that inspire you in the North American Arctic? Um, are there some ideas you have for its future? maybe the next five years, what we've been talking about is the process of inclusion and um, not just saying it, but the actual examples of how that works, working with governments, working with policymakers, working with communities uh, with these shared challenges. And there's a lot of resources that have come out over the last uh, 45 minutes that are going to be put on a website. So anything you might want to share from your office or from your in your perspectives of the future of the North American Arctic and climate collaborations and how we all work together. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the whole panel. Sorry to, to be late. It is indeed an incredibly busy time here uh, in DC and at the State Department, but I was really excited for the chance to, to hop on, mostly to learn from this fantastic panel. Uh, and the conversation that I've heard so far is, is truly um, in the weeds where we need to be, or in the permafrost, deep within the permafrost, maybe, um, of, of where we need to be. So as uh, Dr. Birkin said, I uh, work on uh, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry's team uh, here uh, in DC. And it's an exciting time. Uh, it's a scary time, I think, for, for many of us, particularly those Arctic watchers watching um, the, the region um, that we we care so much about um, witness some of the fastest changes in the world, honestly, in terms of temperature and, and environmental change. Um, and the communities themselves, who I have had the, the pleasure of speaking to and, and hearing from and, and seeing the photos of the communities as their, their sort of permafrost thaws or uh, their local sort of either indigenous or community ecosystem um, services change drastically in front of their eyes. Um, it's It's been, you know, quite affirming to, to understand why the climate uh, crisis and the battle of the next decade is is so central, and that's because the the places in the Arctic and the places um, that are the most vulnerable are seeing these impacts faster and, and more intense than anywhere else. Um, so you talk about inspiration and and how we can work better together, particularly in the North um, American Arctic region. It's something that uh, we spent a lot of time speaking with our uh, Canadian uh, counterparts about, um, with again the local uh, communities and our international partners as well, because we all have similar aspirations. Um, and that was really sort of articulated well in the um, national strategy for the Arctic region that President Biden and the administration put out uh, end of last year. I'm not sure if it's been spoken about, spoken about much already, but this builds on the 2013 uh, strategy that was put out You know, 10 years later. This strategy looks ahead for the next decade. And what I think is really important about it is it takes into account the, the climate change that is already happening um, and really pedals the metal of the electric car, perhaps, on, on a lot of the, the climate forces there. But it also, if you look at the sort of pillars of work, which include security, uh, which I work on, um, as well as climate change and environmental protection, it also sort of raises up sustainable economic development that we were just hearing about, um, and that international cooperation and governance piece. Uh, but more importantly, it, it also is cross-cut by principles that think about if those are the things that we are prioritizing, how do we want to see those priorities through? And first of, of those five principles is consulting, coordinating, and co-managing with Alaska Native tribes and communities. Um, the second is deepening relationships with our allies and partners. And tr I can truly say that the work that we're doing is centering those principles among the others. Um, and in two examples, um, one is a, a program that I was really excited uh, to work with the team here at State on, and that was earlier this year, uh, the we Department of State hosted, along with the University of Alaska Fairbanks, an activity under the One Health Project within the Arctic Council. Um, and this was a One Health, One Future conversation that, that drew over 300 visitors from across the Arctic region to come and talk about their sort of shared challenges they're facing from a health and, and uh, environmental health perspective. Uh, but also to draw on those transboundary ties that has so for so long connected the communities up there to 
address those challenges. Um, so visitors join from Greenland, from Canada, um, from, from all across the Arctic region, and, and specifically specifically talked about this one health nexus in, in the Arctic capacity, and we expect to build on this going forward. Um, obviously, you saw even just last week, uh, our Secretary of State, Secretary Blinken, um, visiting the, the um, Arctic region in Mulea in, um, in Sweden, then in Norway, announcing our northernmost new, uh, new post in Tromsø. This is all really the implementation of that national strategy in which we are trying to work better with our allies, but also work better with, with communities in the region to think holistically about how we're, we're approaching the changes that are happening there. Um, in one final, final uh, bit, because I've already spoken too long, um, I just want to say that the best opportunities that I have seen of approaching these problems um, have been when we really are breaking down those silos between the scientific community that is sort of, sort of so much further along at modeling the changes and modeling uh, what's happening with the policy community, who often has different priorities in mind, uh, particularly on the foreign policy side, you know, with, with geopolitical competition and security dynamics, often taking center stage. Um, it's, it can be difficult for those communities to talk to each other, let alone with the communities actually on the ground um, dealing with these changes. So the, the NSAR, as we call it, sort of sets up new opportunities to do that. It has really been a joy to see when those silos are broken down in, in some of these research activities to understand where are the changes happening, how are that affecting people, and how do we, from a government perspective, take that back and set policy that's future-oriented uh, to address those problems. So I'll stop there uh, and happy to jump in later. Thanks. Thank you so much. Well, I'm actually going to do sort of just uh, because we have a little bit of time, I just was going to go around if folks wouldn't mind. Um, I'll start with Dr. Carlo again. I'll just give you a some moment while I tell you, I was going to ask if you just had sort of a, a, a final few closing uh, remarks before we left and um, and I say goodbye to everyone, but uh, because really you guys have covered so much uh, territory and a lot of these conversations, I will have bullet points and check with all of you to some resources for folks after this webinar when it's posted um, from all different offices and places around the world. So thank you for those. Um, and uh, but so as we kind of round up just uh, the thoughts on climate cooperation, but I think we're hearing it's really on the process of cooperation and respect and elevating uh, ideas and potentially not just uh, policy issues, but um, system changes we're hearing of, of how we actually fund and support and bring voices, um, whether it's an Arctic 180 or uh, however, you know, the, the different ways we can uh, move forward in a, in a way in the North American Arctic that's respectful. So Dr. Carlo, um, since I called you out already, uh, do you have a last few words? Yeah, I'll just highlight um, a few um, things that I think I've heard throughout this conversation um, that are really important. Um, the one is that uh, we need to make new connections, um, connections between researchers, between decision makers, between Arctic communities, international partners. Um, and this is part of the reason I think we're all here today. And we've also all highlighted, I think, a number of different projects and places and programs and efforts that that do that, that, that help build um, stronger the connections that we have with, with each other. And then related to that, we need to um, foster lasting and, and, and trusting relationships. So those types of relationships that are gonna grow with um, projects, um, go grow through different programs and endure into the Arctic's coming decades, which are currently filled with um, so much un uncertainty. Uh, and one of those keys things that sort of I have highlighted throughout is recognizing and understanding the inequities in research um, and policy. Um, and we have a couple of ideas about how to, to move things like that um, forward, and I'm sure there will be many more. So um, <clears throat> I really believe that we uh, can take action to create equity in the work we do across the Arctic. It's going to require us to be bold and in some cases, as I mentioned, um, implement an Arctic 180, flip the script, drive changes that drastically alter outcomes. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for having me and for your uh, attention and time today. Oh, thank you. Um, I will go to uh, uh, Dr. Pelzer next. Yeah, thank you. Thank you again. And. Uh, uh, so I, I'll leave three thoughts. Number one, in terms of this cooperation, obviously we need uh, more of it 
And, uh, but the hopeful thing is that it's already occurring. And in, in, as we saw across the discussion today, so it's building on what we already know we can do. Uh, and that's the hopeful message. I see in the comment section that's raising the question about Arctic security and all this mix around climate change, uh, energy, and so on. So I did want to address the comments uh, on the webinar chat. It, and that is vitally important. And those conversations are, in fact, happening at the community level. Uh, I know in Anubik, when we were there, we had a town hall. This was the Fulbright Arctic Initiative, but those are already advanced. Uh, and, and communities have to be on the front line in any future uh, security uh, questions as we're in a new geopolitical reality. Um, and I invite folks to go to Fulbright Arctic Initiative under the Fulbright program to see the reports that was done by the, uh, the Arctic Security Group in that realm, which canvassed town halls at the local level. But the third and the final point is this. When we're looking at questions about uh, geopolitical security, when we're looking at things of energy security, environmental security, uh, addressing climate change, but really, really importantly, uh, at the local level, uh, community energy security and community economic uh, development and community environmental security. What we have here is, is a very fortuitous confluence of where there can be different national, state level and local uh, policy goals, but often the policy instrument is the same. And this is the advancing clean energy, for example, can have very different uh, policy goals, depending at what level and uh, you're working at, but but these don't have to be at odds. They can be actually very complementary policy goals with with common policy instruments and poly and the, the tremendous opportunity across the Arctic, the North American Arctic. Again, thinking about opportunities like economies of scope, that not only can we solve problems in the Arctic together, but we can also be a, a solution globally. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Skirdow. Yeah, I'll just say very shortly that, you know, remember the value and power of knowledge and uh, to work to enable knowledge flows across sectors, across fields of expertise, across national borders and levels of society. Um, knowledge is key to resilience and adaptation and to avoid negative impacts or minimize them, and also enable people to pursue the opportunities. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Guy, do you have any sort of final words for the group as we move forward? Definitely. I mean, it, again, it's been such a, a pleasure to be here because I think with knowledge and with uh, this conversation focused on knowledge also comes, frankly, the, the second and, and most important aspect of knowledge, which is listening and listening to those who have it. Um, and I think part of what I so love about diplomacy, particularly Arctic diplomacy, is that there is so much knowledge, be it in the academic community or in, in local and indigenous communities about the environment, about how it's changing, about um, you know, the solutions that we need to, to deal with those changes. And so often it's, it's just in my role uh, and a, a sort of convening the right group, breaking down some of those silos and, and sectors like we have here and listening about what people are experiencing and the solutions that they have, even traditional solutions that they've had to uh, sort of deal in what are really quite hostile environments and have been forever. Um, and the adaptive uh, ability and resilience of the communities locally to handle those situations is already so much more um, uh, so much more developed than in many other parts of the world, to be honest. So I think, think that we have a lot to learn um, and listen to from the local communities um, in the region that extends across the rest of the world, right? As we're thinking about how to be more adaptive and more resilient to climate change globally, there are a lot of lessons in the Arctic region um, that we can extend to, to other parts of the world. Um, so hopefully that knowledge just doesn't sit up at the pole, but can go out and, and um, sort of be distributed more broadly as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. And with that, I will thank all of the, my panelists. Thank you all for who zoomed in and for those in the future who may watch this on a recording. Um, I couldn't be more uh, honored to have hosted everyone here. And to be to be honest though, I will say co-hosting, this is a, again, a, we're, we're working on this very closely. This is Dartmouth and the State Department, and it's uh, co-hosted by the Institute of Arctic Studies and the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding and the Office of the US Coordinator for the Arctic Region. This is the first of our North American Arctic speaker series, 
looking at climate cooperation, but we're going to look at so many different topics and bring together people for many discussions into the future. I hope to reach out to all of you who are already on this webinar and many more. And uh, thank you again for being with us. And I look forward to talking with you all in the future and posting all of this on the website. Have a wonderful day. Take care.